All right, so uh, we're now into the second half of unit one, uh, where we start talking about uh, significant figures, some calculations, how to how to maintain our significant figures while we're doing calculations, and essentially just uh, looking at first off just how to make sure we have an, an accurate measurement. Um, uh, no, well, I wouldn't even say accurate, I, mean, I, I shouldn't say accurate, um, a, a measurement that is, you know, good, a good measurement. So <clears throat> when we're looking at measurements, measurements all require a couple of things, but one thing that we don't want it to forget from our uh, measurements is that measurements require a one digit best guess. <clears throat> Every measurement is going to require a one digit best guess. It, it doesn't really matter, matter what vessel, what instrument, uh, ruler, stopwatch, uh, mile marker, uh, scale, electric scale, you know, uh, analog scale, <clears throat> every single measurement you take requires a one digit best guess. So <clears throat> what I mean by this is that uh, if we were to take, I'm going to make a ruler here. And let's see if we can measure this line. <clears throat> well, when we measure this line, you know, we can say, okay, well, I, I can't simply just put one centimeter. Uh, it, it's not one centimeter, right? It's, it's larger than one centimeter, but it's smaller than two centimeters. And because I'm measuring this, I am required to give a one-digit best guess. And this best guess is exactly that, just a best guess. We will never be able to verify that last digit, right? So we can simply say, well, maybe it's a 1.4 centimeters and go, oh, hey, Alex, uh, I think you're wrong there. No, I, the way I'm looking at it, uh, 1.4, you're like, oh, 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 no, Alex, I think it's uh, more 1.6 centimeters. And somebody might be looking at and going, oh, you guys are both wrong. Like, there's, there's no way. This is this is 1.5 centimeters. But each one of these would be a correct measurement because there's no way to verify this last digit. It is simply just a best guess. And this last digit really depends on the accuracy. Oh, paused. All right. So <clears throat> depending on the accuracy of our ruler, right? Maybe I went and I bought this at the 99 cent store. Right. Um, and now, you know, I'm thinking, well, maybe I need a better ruler to maybe maybe get a better measurement. And I go down to uh, uh, Scientific America down there over on, in Orange County and, and I say I need a better ruler and I, I buy a, a better ruler. So now if I were to put this in. Right, and now we can see. Oh, well, I bought a better ruler. Then I can make a better measurement now. And 
because I bought a better ruler, it invalidates all of the measurements that I just made because I made a bit, I got a better ruler. So it, if we remeasure this, well, 1.5, but it's not quite 1.6, is that now I have to make another best guess because I got a new ruler. So we could say this is 1.57 centimeters. And somebody might say, no, 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 no. I think that's 1.55 centimeters. And somebody might thinking, no, 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 no. I think it's 1.58 centimeters. And again, there is no way to verify that this is 1.57, that 5, that 7, that 8. There's no way to verify that in that all of these are now what we consider correct measurements. I know it's at least 1.5. I know it's less than 1.6, and my best guess is in there. All right. So every single measurement is going to require this. Uh, we can see an example. Your, your books give an example. You know, uh, here we're measuring this. <clears throat> it's, you know, we see 20, and this is in milliliters here. Uh, I see 20 milliliters. We, we measure from the bottom of that curve, which is called our meniscus. So we measure from the bottom of that. Uh, it's at least 21, but it's not 22. So maybe this is 21.5, 21.4, 21.6 millimeters, right? Is that we always have to make that best guess when we're in between those two lines there, uh, that we can't ever leave that off of our measurement. So <clears throat> once we take these measurements, um, we end up dealing with these measurements in what we call significant figures. Significant figures. So uh, <clears throat> the first way we deal with significant figure is we, we have kind of a one general rule here, uh, and we say that any non zero number is significant. Any non-zero number of a measurement is significant. Uh, what's a non-zero number? It's any number that's simply just not zero. That's a non-zero number. Any number that's not zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Those are non-zero numbers. So if I were to give you a value of 287, Right. If I said 287 uh, millimeters, well, non-zero number, non-zero number, another non-zero number is that I have, I'm going to add them all, I'm going to say I have three significant figures. So, Three significant figures. Uh, you might hear the term significant digits, right? It, they, it means the same thing. Uh, you might hear the term sig figs. Right? Same thing. You might see me write this. I write this quite often. I'll say SF, significant figure, right? It, they all mean the exact same thing. You know, if I were to give you another value, 31,295, 31, right? I'm going to count up all the non-zero numbers. There's one, two, three, four, five. This is five significant figures, right? Because all I'm simply doing is just counting how many non-zero numbers that I have. So for any non-zero number, like this is pretty simple to count up the number of digits that aren't zeros and get the number of significant figures. Uh, it's not until we get to zero. Zeros tend to be a little trouble. Uh, so we'll go, there, there's four different scenarios when we're dealing with zeros. <clears throat> so the first type I like to cover are what we consider leading zeros. So um, these values that are out front, these zeros here, these zeros are what we call Leading zeros. Leading zeros. They're the zeros that are in the very front of a number. 
And leading zeros are never significant. There's no exception to that rule. Anytime we have a leading zero, it's insignificant. It's, it's, it's insignificant. It's never, ever going to be significant. We're never going to count it. So what do I have to do? I have to count my non-zero numbers, and we say three significant figures. And it doesn't even matter how many I have. I can, I can put a whole bunch of zeros out here. But they're all leading zeros, leading zeros, leading zeros, right? Uh, there's never an exception to the rule. I count my non-zero numbers, and I have one significant figure. Uh, you know, again, it, it really doesn't matter how many there are. As long as I count, they're all leading zeros. Here's my leading zeros, and I'm just going to count these here, and I have three significant figures, right? So that's how we deal with one type of zero. So uh, the next type of zero are what we call uh, captive zeros, right? So if I have a value like uh, two have a question, Wiley? Okay, maybe it's just adjusting. Uh, so these are what we call captives here. So if I have something like this, 259001, uh, right? These are what we're going to consider captive zeros. And captive zeros are always significant. We always count captive zeros. So because those are captive, I now have to count and include those zeros, and I have uh, six significant figures. We always count our captive zeros. Um, Right. <clears throat> captive zero, captive zero, captive zero. I have to count every single digit, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight significant figures. So there's two cases here where either we count them or we never count them. And again, leading zeros there is never an exception to that rule. If it's out in front, we don't count it for significant figures, right? <clears throat> so then we get to values like this. We get to uh, a number that's like uh, two. Let me use a different color here. Uh, two, three, four, five, six. So we have this value, and then we have... I'm going to use a, a black here. All right. These zeros are what we call trailing zeros. Right. Uh, trailing zeros trailing zeros are sometimes significant. Sometimes they're significant, sometimes they're not, right? And I've been, I've been teaching chem probably, I'm going, I think I'm going on like seven years now, seven years um, teaching chemistry, and I actually have a formula now. So I have this formula and I've tested it over the last seven years, and there's never been a case where my formula has not worked. Right? Uh, I haven't, I haven't uh, written a paper just yet, 
but there's never been a single case of where my formula doesn't work where we can't figure out when to count the trailing zero and when not to count it. Okay, so I will give you the formula. It just, you know, uh, write it down somewhere, memorize it, don't memorize it, it's up to you. But my formula works every single time. Okay, and here is my formula. There it is. You know, I know it took up a whole sheet of paper, whatnot, uh, but, you know, uh, make sure that you memorize this formula because I, I tell you, it works every single time. What you're looking for is the decimal point. This is how you're going to determine whether to count your trailing zeros or whether you don't count your trailing zeros. If you physically If you physically see the decimal, if you physically see the decimal, count the trailing zeros. If you physically see that decimal, I'm not, I'm not talking about the imaginary decimal, right? I know that you guys know, I know that you know there's an imaginary decimal at the end of that 25,900, but you don't physically see it. If you physically see the trailing zero, or if you physically see the decimal, count the trailing zero, which means I have five. significant figures. If you don't see the decimal, I know that you know that it's there and there's an imaginary one, but if you don't see the decimal, and I'm going to say physically, if you don't physically see the decimal, don't count the trailing zeros. <clears throat> and that's all that matters when determining trailing zeros. So here, I don't see the decimal place. I have three significant figures. Uh, if I have a value of 20, do I see the decimal? No, I sure don't. This is one significant figure. Do I see the decimal? Yes, this is two significant figures. Do I see the decimal? Yep, I have to count all of this, the zeros because I see the decimal. Uh, I have five significant figures. Right? Uh, I see some commas there, but I don't see a single decimal. I don't physically see it. This is one significant figure. It doesn't matter how many zeros there are. I don't see the decimal. This is one significant figure. Right? <clears throat> so then we get into you know some other ones that we can we can add uh, like 0 0.00. .00 um, 20100. We have three different types of significant or zeros here. We have trailing zeros. The rule, no exception to it. Leading zeros, never significant. There's no rule about a decimal here. The rule is leading zeros, never significant. So I don't have to count those zeros. Captive zero, yep, I always have to count those. Trailing zeros, well, I see a decimal. I do have to count the trailing zeros, that this is five significant figures. And again, that's how we'll keep track of, <clears throat> of uh, maintaining these, uh, the right number of significant figures when we see trailing zeros. 
So that brings us to another topic of rounding uh, values. So uh, when we round values, we don't change the rules for rounding. The rules for rounding, we don't change, but we, we are definitely going to ask you to round a different way. Right. The way we ask it is different than in your math class. Right. Uh, if you're in math, you know, and I, if I ask somebody here, so let me ask somebody here, round this number for me. Can somebody please round that number for me? Which one? Have you rounding down? Just round the number, round 20. Yeah, we round down. And and how do we? Why do we know that? Because everybody knows, you know, less than five, you know, then we have to round down. If, if I were to ask you to round this number for me, then what would you round that to? Thirty. Thirty. Perfect. Right. And we round up because five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have to round up. Right. And that's always been the same rule, and we don't change those rules. But knowing everything we know now about trailing zeros and significant figures let's see what let's understand what we actually did here is that we took a value that is two significant figures and we rounded it to a value that has one significant figure we took a value that has two significant figures and rounded it to a value that only has one significant figure. So <coughs> when we're asking you to round, well, we could ask you to do this. If I have a number here, 7,128, and I want you to round this to three significant figures, well, could somebody round this to three significant figures for me? 7,130. 7,130. As long as I don't put the decimal place there, uh, I have three significant figures. If I want to round this to two significant figures, well, can somebody round it to two significant figures? So we have 7,200, and we're, we're going to round this, and it seems like you want to round this number up, but look at this. Does this value warrant us rounding it up? So because nope. it's a 1, we would round it down, so we would just have – or just keep it the same there. We wouldn't round it down, but we would have 7,100. If I round around this to one significant figure, uh, I'm going to round this to 7,000. Right. So we definitely don't, you know, we definitely ask you to round it a different way. And what we've done here is we've, you know, we've <clears throat> is not to confuse this because I have had students do this before in the past. Is that I, we've asked them to round it to three significant figures, and they give me this 713. I say, well, why did you round? What happened? I mean, 713, I start off with 7,000, and you round it to 700, right? It, we can't just lop off that last digit that's in the ones place, right? Is that we have to round it and add some insignificant uh, zero there. <clears throat> All right, so continuing on, uh, we're going to now take care. We're going to use all these rules, uh, rules for rounding, uh, significant figures, and we're going to use these values and or use these rules and apply them to uh, multiplication. And division. So multiplication and division. Uh, if I have a measurement here, so we'll say 2.334 centimeters, and I multiply that by 0 0.320 uh, centimeters. Well, let's see what the calculator gives us. So the calculator gives me a 2.334 
times 0 0.320, and I get 0 0.74688. Well, our rule of thumb for multiplication and division is the measurement with the least amount of significant figures. Right? We're going to use the measurement with the least amount of significant figures. So here I have four significant figures. Uh, I see the decimal place. I have to count to zero. Three significant figures is that my answer now has to be three significant figures. My answer is 0 0.747 centimeter, oh, not cubed, but centimeter squared. Three significant figures, three significant figures, three significant figures. Um, same thing for division, right? Uh, 55.8752. And we're going to multiply that by, let's say, 56.5, uh, right? Well, what does the calculator give us? We have 55.8752 minus 56.5, and this comes out to, oh, we should be divide. Let me divide here, not, not multiply. Let's actually divide. 0.9. Well, let's take a look at what we have here. I have uh, six significant figures, three significant figures. My answer has to reflect three significant figures. 0.989. And I now have three significant figures. Um, even if it were mixed mixed multiplication division, if it's mixed multiplication division, uh, it's still the same concept holds there. Uh, we can do 0 0.61 times 3.395, uh, divide that by 0 0.261 times... Um, 1.57 or 5631, right? Well, let's get our answer first. 0.61 times 3.395 divided by 0.261 divided by 1.5631, 5 5.07624. Well, let's take a look at sig figs here. I have uh, 2, 4, 3, 5. Well, two significant figures wins. My answer is 5.12 significant figures. So <clears throat> even if we combine multiplication division, uh, we, it's still all the same rule is the one with the least amount of decimal places is the one we use in order to determine uh, the number of significant figures for our answer. Then it comes down to um, addition and subtraction have a different rule. Addition and subtraction have a, a different rule, and the rule there is um, we use the measurement with the smallest number 
of decimal places. <laughs> the smallest number of decimal places. So we're going to give you some values here. Let's say we had uh, 486 minus 421.23. And, you know, uh, I, I have some OCD, and maybe you have some OCD, and you're looking at this, and you're going, ah, that's not what they taught me in elementary school. In elementary school, they said to line up my zeros, line up my decimal places, and I have to put these in. No, we do not do that, right? We're past that point. We can definitely calculate those without having to look at those zeros, on it, even though if it looks funny, right? So we solve the, the problem, uh, 7, 7, 4, uh, 6. All right. The smallest number of decimal places. This is zero past the decimal. This is two past the decimal. Well, we're going to go with zero past the decimal, and my answer is going to be 65. It doesn't matter that one is three significant figures, one is five significant figures, and my answer is only two significant figures. Uh, my answer reflects zero past the decimal, and that's how we deal with addition subtraction. Uh, let's do one that's addition, right? Um, how about 9.2? Zero point nine one. Right. Uh, this is one past the decimal. This is two past the decimal. Well, one past the decimal wins. Uh, so I have what is the answer? Here's so I've got uh, one, eleven, ten. We're at one past the decimal. My answer here is ten point one. A measurement with the least amount of decimal places. All right. So we talked about density um, last week. And let's actually calculate density, but density with mixed order of operations. All right? Density with mixed order of operations. So uh, I'm going to use this triangle here. This triangle uh, represents something we call change. It does represent other stuff. We can use it to represent heat, but for right now, uh, triangle is going to mean change. So we're going to say change uh, in volume. In order to calculate change in volume is we take what we're going to call final volume minus initial volume. And we can see that, uh, let's see if we can find it here. Yeah, so we can see it in something like this. So we can calculate density of, of, of objects that we can't really calculate, you know, um, a volume for it. Maybe it's not a perfect square, maybe it's not a perfect circle, but some object and we need the volume. So we use water displacement. So we see that we have some initial volume here, it says 13.5 milliliters. And once we put the piece of rebar in there, the volume of the water goes up and we use that displacement measurement. Um, it displaces uh, some water and the volume goes up to 22.4. Well, if we take the difference of those two, we can calculate the volume of that rebar, right? So here again, you know, we have some object here uh, we have some water, <clears throat> we're going to calculate the density because we do have the mass and we can calculate final volume. But in order to do this, it is going to be mixed order, right? So uh, what do we have? 19.8 is the final volume. Volume final is 19.8. Volume initial is 17.1. And our mass is 51.842.
51.8, oh, D1.2. All right. So as far as density goes, density is equal to mass over volume. So we have a mass of 51.842. And we have a, and it's always final, always final minus initial, right? So our final is 19.8 minus 17.1. <laughs> I know at this point you can put this in your calculator and out you're going to have some some answer. And let's just let's just do that. I'm going to put this into my calculator. My calculator is going to say so we go 51.842 uh, divided by 19.8 minus 17.1, and the calculator says I get 19.2007. And you might be looking at this and go, okay, I have a five six figs, three six figs, three six figs. My answer is three six figs, and you're completely wrong. That's not how we're going to solve this problem. Is that because I have division, and I have to do some subtraction? We have to keep these separate. If it was all division, all multiplication, or all multiplication division I can put I can do this in one shot but because I have a different rule that I have to abide by well then I have to separate these significant figures so first we'll solve this so we have uh, 51.842 grams and I'm going to divide that by the volume so the volume here we have 19.1 minus or I'm sorry 19.8 minus 17.1, and we have 2.8. Uh, one past the decimal, one past the decimal. Oh, look at that. Two past the decimal. That needs to be adjusted. 51.842 grams over 2.8 one milliliters. Now I can, since I took care of that, now I'm going to take care of the multiplication division here. So 51.842 divided by Four significant figures, two significant figures. My answer needs to be two significant figures. 25 grams per mil. I can look that right away. Does it seem off a little bit? I think the difference in the denominator should be 2.7. Is that what it is? Two points. Oh, I did. I think I, I put 19.18. Yep. Let's re let's recalculate this. Yep. Not two point. Oh, I see what I did. Yep. Uh, come on. Yep. Two point. This is two. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely correct. Let me back this up. Review my calculations, guys. All right, and we go with 2.7. So this is what 51.842 divided by 2.7. Uh, but again, here we have two significant figures, five significant figures. My answer has to be two significant figures. So you get 19 point, or just 19 grams per milliliter. Okay, so <clears throat> I, I, gotta, I gotta pay attention to chat, but yeah, thank you for keeping an eye on my calculations there. 
So <clears throat> this is how we, we take care of these mixed order. When I have to do a combination of addition, subtraction, and multiplication division, as we do have to keep those separate in order to get our final answer right. Um, on an exam, would I put both? Yeah, I absolutely would. One answer would be 19.2, and then I would have 19. For those of you that ignore the rules and go uh, five six figs three three my answer need three six figs you, and you mark nineteen point two and go oh yeah look at that nineteen point two Jordan face back swish all net no you're completely wrong because you didn't remember the rules right you didn't remember the rules and the answer is just simply nineteen okay so definitely something I I would put on an exam. <laughs> Um, some terms to cover. Let's see. Oh, we're doing we're doing okay on time. Uh, some terms that we do have to cover. Uh, terms for accuracy and precision. So uh, accurate and precision. We we kind of use just to kind of start to explain this is we kind of use a little uh, bullseye here to uh, demonstrate accuracy and, and precision. So when something is uh, accurate and precise is when I can take and I can shoot at this target and all of my shots hit the bullseye. All right. I know I'm supposed to hit the center. They all hit the center. This is accurate. My shots were accurate and they were precise because they were all close and together. Well, sometimes, you know, that doesn't happen. Sometimes maybe we, we can be um, precise but not accurate, which means that all of my shots are going to be close together, but uh, I definitely missed the target. Right, and they're not accurate, you know. And then, you know, if we pull out a shotgun and we get some, some, you know, bird shot out here, uh, is that something like this would be neither uh, accurate or precise. So now if we kind of start thinking maybe in terms of, of measurements, how would this look if we were taking a look at measurements? Well, say my target, say my theoretical measurement, um, that I'm, I'm going to measure some volume of, of water, and what I had to measure, I should measure 283.0 milliliters. Well, if I'm accurate and precise, all of my measurements should line up similar to this, right? Uh, we'll say 283.1, 283.2, 282.9, 282.8, and my measurements here were, were very precise and they were very accurate. Well, <clears throat> Maybe I was using a, a flask, or maybe I was using a graduated cylinder, um, not a flask, maybe I was using a graduated cylinder and something was wrong, and it just didn't, didn't measure very accurately that, that I missed the target. So maybe I'm at 292, uh, 2.1, 292, 291.8, 291.9, and we could say here, that that I was I was pretty precise, but I I just didn't hit the theoretical mark. I wasn't very accurate. Um, can you be accurate and not precise? No, no. Well, you couldn't be accurate and and not precise. Is that you'd have to be accurate and precise. You can be precise but not accurate. But uh, yeah, you can't be accurate and not precise. Right. So I don't that wouldn't that wouldn't happen. Um, you're either you got it or you you missed it. Right. Um, <clears throat> here. Um, and, then, you know, if we're just having a horrible day, maybe we're measuring something here and we're, you know, three hundred and five point eight milliliters, two hundred and seventy point nine milliliters. Um, 
you know, 300.0 milliliters, 295, yeah, 290.5 milliliters is that, whatever, whatever reason we're having a bad day, we just couldn't hit the target and we're not even accurate, we're not precise, right? <coughs> so those are just some terms that we had to cover. Which kind of brings us now to um, talking about something uh, we call dimensional analysis. You're going you're gonna to be doing dimensional analysis for the next two semesters, right? This semester, and if you take Gen Chem 202, you're still going to be doing dimensional analysis. You, you just can't get away from it um, as a chemist, as a scientist. So dimensional analysis. is we have some value with some specific unit and we want to convert that unit to something else, right? Uh, I want to convert miles to centimeters. I want to convert, um, you know, uh, seconds into years, right? We consider that to be dimensional analysis. And for dimensional analysis, we use what we call unit, conversion factors, unit conversion factors. And what a unit conversion factor is, a unit conversion factor is a ratio of two equivalent quantities. Two equivalent quantities with different measurement units. <clears throat> we get these from what we call um, definition. So this would be considered a, a definition. Is that one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters, right? <clears throat> and I can put this into a ratio, right? I can put this into ratio by simply saying, um, I can put one inch over 2.54 centimeters, or I can write it as 2.54 centimeters over one inch. And we can see that meets our definition. So these are conversion factors. Ratios of two equivalent quantities, one inch, does equal 2.5 centimeters, and they both have different units, right? So two equivalent quantities with different measurement units. Uh, we can do this with time. You know, we can say uh, 60 seconds is equal to one minute. So I can write this as 60 seconds over one minute, or I can write it as one minute, 60 seconds. Uh, we could do it with mass. <clears throat> um, we could say that uh, one pound is equal to 454 grams. So I can write it as 400 and, oops, 454 grams over one pound, or as one pound grams. And we can now use these conversion factors to do dimensional analysis, right? If I want to convert uh, 23.6 pounds, and I want to convert that to grams, well, I'm going to need one of these conversion factors to do that. So in order to use these conversion factors, our whole thought process here should be cross cancel. I have something in the numerator and I want to cancel it with something in the denominator. So 23.6 pounds and I want to multiply that something that is going to cancel out those pounds. 
So only one of these is going to work. One of these is going to cancel out Right, one of those is going to be able to cancel out pounds so that if I write uh, 454 grams over one pound is that these units cancel out and I get 10,714.4 grams. But now I got to think significant figures. Well, I'll tell you one thing about these definitions and about these conversion factors is that we do not definitions or conversion factors when determining significant figures. These fall under the category of what we call um, exact numbers. So uh, an exact number is not a measurement. An exact number is anything you can, you can count. I have uh, two calculators on my desk. I have five pens in the drawer. I have you know, um, three, mo I shouldn't tell you guys, I, had, I do have three monitors, but uh, you know, I, I have three monitors on my desk, right? So um, anything I can count physically, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, that's an exact number. And when it comes to exact numbers, we don't use those to determine significant figures. But what's also an exact number are definitions. There are exactly 60 seconds in one minute. If I said, are there 59 seconds, I mean, it, is one minute equal to 59 seconds? Well, that's just not the case because there's 60 seconds in a minute, exactly 60 seconds in a minute. If there's 60.1 seconds, that's not a minute anymore. I've gone over a minute. If I have 59.5 seconds, well, it's about a minute, but I need 60 exactly. So any definition we come across is not used for significant figures because they are exact. And because conversion factors come from our definitions, those are exact as well, which means the only thing I can use here is my measurement in order to determine significant figures. Three significant figures. I'm going to ignore the conversion factor, and my answer needs to be three significant figures uh, that I am at 10,700 grams, uh, 1.07 times 10 to the 4 grams, right? Either one of these would be an acceptable answer. Um, Sometimes we need more than one conversion factor, right? Um, sometimes we need one more than one more conversion factor. Uh, let's say we're going to go to uh, 200 and um, 256 ounces, and I want to convert those ounces into pounds. Well, let's see. One ounce is equal to 31.103 grams. And we know that 454 grams is equal to one pound. Well, let's start off with 256 ounces. I'm going to need a conversion factor. So let's use this definition where one ounce is equal to 31.103 grams. And I've canceled out these units here. Well, now I have to cancel out the grams to get to the pounds. So now I'm going to use this definition. 454 grams for every one pound. I can cancel out these units. And I make the calculation and I get uh, 
17. Pounds. Well, let's take a look at significant figures. Uh, I'm going to ignore this conversion factor, conversion factor. Uh, I'm just going to go with my measurement here. Three significant figures, three significant figures. I'll round this to 17.5 pounds, three significant figures. Uh, I guess let's do one more. Uh, let's see, we needed to convert, uh, what time is it? 1034, all right, we're good. Uh, 2.5 feet cubed. And I want to convert that to centimeters cubed. All right, <clears throat> let's give a couple definitions here. One foot is equal to 12 inches and one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. All right. So we'll start out, we'll say, okay, I got 2.5 feet cubed, and I need one of these definitions here. So uh, let's use uh, feet, so go feet to inches and then inches to centimeters. So let's use this first. Say one foot over 12 inches. But this is feet cubed, and I only have one foot here, which means that I have to cube this. All right, once I do that, right, well, now I can get rid of these units, and we'll multiply this by the next conversion factor, and we'll say uh, one inch. 2.54 centimeters, but we want centimeters cubed, which means I'm going to cube that as well. <clears throat> and the long way of doing this, and it doesn't really matter, whichever one you're comfortable with, it doesn't really matter which method. Uh, we could go 2.5 feet cubed times inches over one foot. And it, it, it works out exactly the same. I have three feet, one, two, three. Three inches, inch, 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 and I'm still going to end up with centimeters cubed. So whichever method you prefer, it doesn't really matter to me uh, as long as you get the, the answer. So the answer to this is 2.5, 12, 2.54, Seventy thousand seven hundred and ninety two point one centimeters cubed. <clears throat> well, let's ignore our conversion factors and we're just going to rely on this data, two significant figures. So I am at seventy one thousand centimeters cubed, or I'm at seven point one times ten to the four centimeters cubed. All right. And um, now we'll take a look at, uh, I don't spend much time on temperature simply because, uh, you know, you memorize them and, you know, out comes uh, some number, you know, uh, out comes some number. So we don't, uh, spend much time on them, but I'll just give you the, the definitions and we'll do a, a couple calculations and then we, you know, I think that'll probably call it a day for, for temperature here. So as far as temperatures go, uh, first we have uh, Fahrenheit. So Fahrenheit, and in order to calculate Fahrenheit, uh, we use the formula Fahrenheit is equal to 1.8 
times degrees Celsius. And this answer is added to 32. Uh, it, your books might say 9 divided by 5, but 9 divided by 5 is equal to 1.8, right? So it doesn't really matter which, which one you use. This is just the one I use. Uh, I don't like dealing with fractions. Um, and then we have Celsius. And in order to calculate Celsius, Celsius is equal to degree Fahrenheit minus 32. And that is divided by 1.8. Then we have Kelvin. <clears throat> Kelvin, in order to calculate Kelvin, we take our degree Celsius plus 273.15. And you'll notice that it's not degree Kelvin. It's simply just Kelvin. We have degrees Fahrenheit, degree Celsius, Kelvin. Uh, something about Celsius and Fahrenheit is that we can go negative, right? I can have negative 10 degrees, negative 20 degrees, negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit Celsius. But Kelvin stops at zero. There is no negative Kelvin, right? The coldest anything will ever get will simply just be zero Kelvin. So it does have a finite ending to that temperature scale. Um, we use Celsius when we talk about boiling water. There, so when we talk about boiling water, water boils uh, at 100 degrees Celsius and freezes at zero degrees Celsius. So we talk about Fahrenheit, uh, I think, I believe it's 212 degrees. Uh, Fahrenheit is when uh, water freezes and uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Nope, let me skip that. I have that opposite, boils. Freezes. Uh, and the reason it's off like that is, is Celsius was developed around pure water. Uh, Fahrenheit was not developed around pure water, right? That scale was developed on when um, the sea, when seawater freezes and, and, and boils, right? So, uh, you know, uh, it's, they have a different, uh, a different temperature scale, but that Fahrenheit, again, was developed around brine or around seawater while Celsius wasn't. So let's calculate a, a couple of problems here. Let's say we want to convert uh, 80.92 degrees Celsius. Uh, let's convert it to Kelvin and we'll convert it to degrees Fahrenheit. So again, we just, we just use our, um, sorry about that, I was coughing. Uh, we just go ahead and use our, our these are definitions, right? Um, all of these are considered definitions, definitions that are exact numbers. So, we're only going to pay attention for significant figures. We need to pay attention to this, okay? So when we're calculating Kelvin, Kelvin is equal to the degree Celsius, 80.92 plus 273.15. 80.92 plus 273.15, and I get, 354.07 Kelvin. Well, two past the decimal because I added it and I'm at two past the decimal. So uh, we do have a, an answer for that. Uh, now we'll do Fahrenheit. So uh, degrees Fahrenheit. One point eight times our degree Celsius, 80.92 plus 32, 1.8 times 32, 
five, six. All right. Um, four significant figures, four significant figures, 177.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, in order to maintain those uh, significant figures there. But uh, I think that uh, that ends uh, unit one.